be able to uh, ha to advocate for others where you are. You might have other people now. If you actually I don't, let's let's try let's try something interesting. How many of you have actually read the newsletter? Great. Thank you, Angie. I didn't see a hand. <laughs> the um, the the um, and I put down and I wrote this piece, and it's just to designed to describe the different forms of advocacy. You've got case advocacy, where you're looking on helping getting access to a service or a benefit. You've got your own advocacy, where you're going out and you might not, you might be in a situation where you're being refused something. So you've got to go in and argue for yourself. You've got peer advocacy, which is what a lot of what happens inside uh, support groups that you're getting, you're getting peers and your peer group are actually looking after you. You've got a paid independent advocate and there are quite a few you froze, you froze up a little bit, John. Who actually will go in and they will... Sorry? You were frozen up for a few minutes there. Go back to um, paid advocacy. Right, so you've got paid advocacy who can go in and actually do things for you. In Europe, we have bureaus which are voluntary. They might be called a citizen's vice bureau. They might be called an independent bureau. They might be government funded. They might be a paid advocate coming out of a group such as uh, PHI or the British Polio Fellowship or somebody like that. Um, you've got system. Uh, you've got uh, citizen advocates as well, who involves a, work, a volunteer working with an, an individual. Now, a lot of that happens inside of the autistic community and inside of mental health areas where they've got somebody sitting alongside and just maybe just being there and being a, a friend and being able to listen and to prompt. You've got systems advocacy. I can never get that word out. Um, which looks at focusing on looking at changing practices and they make a, a, a good example of those you'll find up on Capitol Hill they're called lobbyists um, you know the, a lobbyist is an advocate uh, he may be paid he, well. he, he she him or her may be paid but they may not be paid or they may get benefit so you just got to it's, it's an important way of doing things uh, so that you, it enables people to live a full and meaningful and quite often independent life. And it keeps people going for life. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to throw, uh, and Ken's got the slides for it. Uh, we're going to throw a series of scenarios at you. Um, and we want to hear from you uh, uh, and you'll have to sort of put your hand up so we can actually see who wants to talk, uh, mm -hmm. you know, using the golden hand on the Zoom screen. And we will go through and we will find out what you would do to advocate for maybe yourself, maybe somebody else, maybe for a group or something like that in the in in these situations. So Ken, over to you, you've got the slideshow. Yeah, thank you, uh, hopefully it works. But before we do that, I do wanna mention um, uh, Wes ha ha yes. Hazlett. Hazlett, I don't know any of those of you in this group who knew Wes or had a contact with Wes. Wes was involved with us in the early, um, he, uh, uh, for those who don't know, he died from cancer uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, but he um, was quite a person, um, and he was involved in this group in the early day, in the early stages of the group, and um, very proud to be a part of it. But he was an advocate. Yeah. Wes Wes was always out there talking to the media about post polio syndrome and making sure that the media was giving the right information. He was he was very proud to do that. Um, 
I admired him for that. Um, and he was also very much uh, a family person. I, the short time I knew Wes, which was only for a few months and had conversations with him, I learned to respect him and, um, and really like what he was doing. And I'm very saddened by, by his death. So I, I just want to take a few minutes to recognize Wes in this group um, because he was here. He was here for months and we would have conversations and he wanted to be very much a part of what we were doing. So, um, and now if all goes well, I will screen share. Those um, may have may remember that there, move you guys out of the way. Um, there was a, no, a show and I think it still goes on every so often on one of the networks called, um, and I'll move you guys again. There you go. Because what would you do? So I have, uh, we, uh, John and I have put together some scenarios here. Um, and I'd like to just see what people would do in these situations if they were faced with it. And I need to change this over to screen slideshow and start at the beginning and let people in here. Okay. So I'm going to need to move you guys somewhere. No way. There you go. Okay, got you on the bottom. Now I got this in my way. Screen share has never been one of my strengths. Okay, now I get that to the bottom. All right, I think we're all set in it. So in this particular case, uh, Sharon, um, uh, woman Sharon, she encountered a significant hurdle upon receiving an invitation to attend a local government meeting and, um, and voice her opinions on an upcoming legislation. Um, Sharon um, has polio and she's in a wheelchair. So regrettably, she discovered that the, um, the only entrance, the sole entrance to the building had a long set of stairs rendering her unable to join in and contribute her thoughts. So she, as a citizen, had a right to go there and express her opinion on a particular legislation that were coming in, but it, she had no access to it. I'm just wondering what people might do in that particular situation as an advocate. Well, this I is, think- I, This I think is why you must put, Sorry, Ina. This is why you must put up and show a hand on the screen, which I've got one, because otherwise we won't be able to see who you are. Sorry, Ina. No, no, it was my fault. Go ahead. So anybody have any thoughts? We have a hand up, Dominica, Dominica, and I'm sorry, I can't see the whole screen at this point. Okay. Um, yes, actually, this sort of resonates with me because my church was donated a, 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 a church hall a few years ago and when the church hall went up it was great excitement and you know big ceremony when it was opened and so on and then I observed that there was no real uh, wheelchair access um, it's not a long flight of stairs there is a ramp at one end of the building but it comes off a very rough grassy area, which would be difficult, you know, to navigate a wheelchair. And then each doorway, there are several doorways in, and none of them has a ramp, and there's the little step up, which, of course, uh, you know, most of us realise when you're wheeling something and you have a little step, it can, it's, it's difficult, especially when you're pushing somebody heavy in a wheelchair. I mentioned it to one of the, um, I think I mentioned it to the priest, I also mentioned it to one of the people on the church council. Nothing has been done about it. I suppose, uh, well, we had COVID, so the church hall wasn't being used very much, but that's all I've done so far. But now that this question has come up, obviously I need to do more because it's something that really annoyed me that to see that there wasn't a proper um, walkway leading to the bottom of the one ramp that exists. And then each, because uh, the ramp goes up onto a sort of veranda, and then you have a, a, a little step at every doorway. So it, it's a real situation and it does happen and it shouldn't happen because 
in Jamaica, public buildings are supposed to nowadays be built with um, disabled access, but clearly it's not. <clears throat> but I, I'll have, I, I'm going to get back to it. Okay, good. That's excellent. And I think uh, as an advocate, your voice uh, and continual voice and persistency and tenacity is, is what's important in this particular thing. And I, don't, I know in the ADA in the United States, there has to be a certain age of the building, but still you have a right, whether you're in a wheelchair or not in a wheelchair, to access and 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 particularly like in a church or in this particular situation, it was a it was a government uh, situation. Ina, um, you're talking to me now. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I the idea for you though I think would be to uh, become very equipped with the information that you would need in order to understand what had to be done to make it accessible. So that might mean getting a free estimate from um, a local laborer about putting a, a new walkway or a covered walk over the gravelly grassy area, and then to find out the cost of those little removable ramps that people put down over one step, going, you know, a door frame or a threshold. So I think you need to be armed with the information before you um, begin to advocate for it, because then you would have all the facts of what would be needed. And then I would have a bake sale. I would do whatever fundraising I could that might've been under the auspices of the church or not for just some of the people in the church. Very good. Thanks, Anna. Pleasure. Paula? Paula, oh, you're on mute. Sometimes that's best. Um, <laughs> put up a hand. I was asked. Is that by, something I want to contribute? Okay. I, I was asked by a church group to which I did not belong to speak about polio and bracing because they'd had some bad strokes and hip issues with the uh, hip fractures with some of the women in the women's group and the pastor came to the meeting this is just after our 2017 6.0 earthquake uh access to the building was nearly impossible for me and so i got in <clears throat> was speaking to them <coughs> excuse me and the um pastor was talking about having uh, the architects redesign the entrance and that type of thing. There was no access to bathrooms. Um, and I just looked him straight in the face and I said, I'm not a formal ADA person, but I would be very happy to wander around the building with you and comment on areas where I find it very difficult to uh, access. He sat there with a deadpan face, like he hadn't even seen me. And afterwards, the woman who had invited me to speak to the group came up and she said, you just saw the wall that we're up against. And since I was not a member of the church or anything, I said to her, if this comes up again, I am still open to doing this. But if I, since I'm not a member of the church, um, it was a little bit awkward, but you know, it was a way to speak out and say, this place sucks. You guys are um, you know, doing major repairs from an earthquake. Why don't you do it right? Ah, very good. And there you go. So you were a voice again. Yeah. Rather than being silent, you saw the problems. You pointed yeah. it out. Maybe you ran into some resistance, but the fact that you spoke up was important. Rather than, um, it's certainly much more important than being silent. Well, they also knew that my ex was a member of that church. Uh, 
Okay. Well, it helped a little bit. <laughs> well, no, I think it didn't help. <laughs> well, I still say you spoke up. You brought it to their yes, attention. Yeah, they yeah. maybe have given you a resistance at this point, but maybe you caused some thinking, hopefully. hopefully. Yeah. But uh, once again, being an advocate is not, is once again, do, uh, speaking up, but then being persistent and being to the point where you're a pain, you're a pain in the neck. Um, and, and, and that's, you know, that expression, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So, and uh, that's what an advocate is basically it has to be sometimes a squeaky wheel, Diane, Diane. Okay. My situation was, uh, the local library has a lot of programs. And so when I retired, I wanted to go to them and it became more difficult for me to go up the stairs, uh, no railing in the front. So I was at a human rights uh, conference and talked to a person. And so she was able to talk to the library and have me have permission for me to go in the back entrance where there was one railing and that worked for a while. But then it was too difficult for me to, I could go down fine, but not get up. So I asked if I could have a second railing. And it was like punishment for asking. Suddenly they said the back entrance is not safe for people. So basically to me, I thought I was banned because I suggested an improvement. So I wrote a letter to the editor and um, lo and behold, I imagine they were a bit um, slow for news on December 31st of that year. It's a few, four or five years back. I had a person from our local paper come out, interviewed me, and got the story. So that was on the front page of the Leader Post on December wow. 31st. And suddenly I got a phone call from the head of, we have several libraries, it's, we're not a big city, but um, a phone call that uh, the local library manager would meet with me. So he met with me and they put in another railing and I did stress that, yes, that railing was fine for me, but the library was still not available for the rest of the population in our neighborhood. And I pushed it. I pay local taxes, which support the library, and it just isn't fair. So they're working on getting a wheelchair entrance. Yay. So, yeah, that was just, you know, a little... A little bit of push and it worked. What a great that, story. That, Diane, is how you are actually advocating for the whole of the community which has disabilities or has mobility problems. And that's not just only people who are in wheelchairs, but it's also no. in the library. You, you've got mothers with their push chairs and their buggies and everybody, everything else like that. So you're doing oh, a great, it, that's yeah, a great absolutely. job. Absolutely, because I've lived in my house for 52 years and my um, mother-in-law babysat and it, she would take my daughter to programs at that library or I would take them. So you're absolutely right. There's lots of young moms in our neighborhood. Love the story. Great story, Diane. Thank you for your advocacy. Constance. Indeed, thank you, Ken. Um, the idea uh, that I think resonated the most when I was reading that was the fact that you had the word local government meeting. Those three words set off flares in my head. We are not talking about a private enterprise. We are not talking about my cousin's home. We are talking about a government facility. Every state in the country, every country in the world has certain guidelines that governments, whether they are local, state, or federal, <coughs> whatever, um, have to follow. So you have an automatic answer access through uh, that venue to address the advocacy questions. Now, how you go about doing it either makes you sound militant or supportive. So it's the not just the who and the what, but it's also the how you're going to go about approaching it. And it's it can be dealt with. It can be dealt with seriously. Sharon's got a situation right there where she got invited to Go back to the people who invited you and said, I would love to, I would be more than delighted to. Here's my right. dilemma. How can we solve it? And by the way, I have this and this suggestion, but would love to hear your ideas and see what they can and are willing to do. It's a, it's a collaborative process. It's much more effective than it's a, when it's a combative process. 
but it's important that no matter what we do, when we recognize there's a challenge and a problem, not only do we need to name the problem, we need to also be able to be willing to offer potential suggestions up to and including making us the poster child for change when we meet with resistance by going to a larger audience or a larger potential clientele and even the media, if necessary, saying, hey, I got invited to speak. I'm having a dilemma. How can we do this? And oftentimes, simple solutions can be arranged for with little um, th out of the box thinking. And that's really the most important thing for us to do is get our heads out of the box and look at how else can we do this? I always say, forget about plan A. Plan A has never worked in my life. So I always look for what plan B, C, D. And by the way, there are a whole bunch of other letters I can go to to find more plans to get around <laughs> the dilemma. So you're so right. <laughs> that's Excellent. Excellent. That's I, what I got. <laughs> I, I think you're absolutely right about the tone and how we do it too. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is that word diplomacy, uh, and do it in a diplom um, a diplomacy way. If you if you come across as being too aggressive, you're just going to turn them off. But if right. you think about diplomacy before you do it, you know what they say about diplomacy. Diplomacy is knowing how to tell somebody to, to go to hell and enjoy the trip. Indeed. So that's that, you know, that's, you, it, it, and I think too, plan having plan B and C is also good because sometimes if diplomacy doesn't work, then you got to think about another strategy to use it. Mm -hmm. But diplomacy is always the first best approach to it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Florence? Florence, you're on mute. Okay. Can you hear me? Like yeah. Florence, yeah. Okay, good. When I read the blurb here, a couple of things came to mind. First of all, when she got the invitation, Sharon should have called to find out if it was accessible. Number one. Number two, when she got there, had she not called and she saw the steps, she had really, I, I can see two possible solutions. One, to send somebody upstairs to speak to whoever's in charge and see if they can get her up the steps if she wanted to be lifted, or two, to submit her suggestions, which I'm sure she had written out so that she could contribute. And then third, after it was all over, then you start getting it accessible. But for her immediate situation, she had to advocate for her thoughts. And that's what I see as the solution for this. But she could sue under the ADA and get a different entrance. I've sued the local hospital here. Um, in Florida, we have Cleveland Clinic. And one, the ramps were not proper on the sidewalk. Two, the, the rooms, the examining rooms are so small that they have to take the chairs out. So they made one big one for a wheelchair which obviously they don't use, but at least it's there. They've got a Hoya lift. They've got accessible scales. And uh, I think for Sharon, she could have handled it better. That's my thoughts. And she could have, but obviously yeah. then, and I agree with you on that. She probably may, maybe should have done a little homework beforehand, but- Right, she could have um, called. Yeah, no, she could have, but still, the fact that it was not accessible is improper. Is yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're absolutely right. But she did go and she did meet the barrier. Now, how are you <laughs> going to solve it? How are you going to get your thoughts expressed? Yeah. Because, you know, you can't go crazy, as you said, which right. is you know, very easy to do. Right. If she, if she wanted to get her thoughts. Right. The A, send them up with somebody. Uh, in writing, you know, yep. so she could express what she had to say. Absolutely, then, there are there are other alternatives. They could have also provided a, a virtual alternative. Absolutely, right. absolutely. We're doing it virtual. Right. Exactly. But, you know, you're absolutely right. So, yes. so, so, and and once again, you mentioned the ADA, and I think yeah. it's important that we are all familiar with the laws in our countries. So we at least know when the situation happens what we right. have a right we have a right to. We have okay. a situation where I live, 
I live, yeah. in, I live in Century Village in Florida. The buses that they have to take you around, the bottom step is so high that uh, the older person with a walker can't go up and the bus drivers are not allowed to touch the walker. So now we got a lot of people locked in and in order to sue, you need a name of somebody that takes the bus. Well, a 90 year old woman's not gonna give her name. Right. She's frightened. You know, it's it's not an easy situation. Absolutely not. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. Yes. We'll, we'll go over to George. Hi. Um on on the general thing about about um non-accessibility over here we have uh in most towns we have um access panels um they're made up of uh representatives from you know various uh, uh groups uh, representing the disabled people um and so one of the things that i suppose i would do not knowing in, in enough about the technicalities of solving every individual problem would be in fact to refer the the building uh, to to the access panel because they've, they've got loads of experience of 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 uh, negotiating with uh, shops and um, restaurants uh, and public buildings uh, where 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 older buildings particularly where where it's difficult to uh, to make uh, uh, changes, but they, they have the, the expertise and experience uh, and, and they're really good at this kind of negotiation. So mm -hmm. sometimes um, finding the right person to be the right advocate uh, with with the knowledge is, is probably a good thing. Okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. And one thing too you mentioned is that you got you know also what the groups are in your area that will support you. Um, and are there for you. And in situations like this, it does start with one person advocacy, but then it can and get, it can go into other uh, people in the community that believe in the same thing that you believe in. Ina, is your hand still up or what? Yeah, it is. I wanted to, there's a thread that runs through a lot of this, and that is that we have to be personally courageous yeah. and that we have to take the first step. I mean, yeah. I, I wasn't, until, you know, John mentioned it, I didn't realize that my advocacy for myself would have impact for other people as well. I used to um, be a food critic for restaurants that only serve breakfast. And I went to one one day um, and it was after I started using a scooter full time that I realized I couldn't get in. And I was not an undercover reviewer. So I asked to see the owner or the manager who had to come out on the street. And I introduced myself and I said, I've heard really good things about your restaurant. I would like to review it. But as you can see, I can't get in. I said, and so I'm going to make some suggestions to you about how I can get in. And that is a foldable ramp that you can keep inside and someone can say, I need the ramp. Um, and then I need to know about the seating inside as well. So I'm going to give you these opportunities and then I'm going to tell, ask you to call me when you're ready and I will come back and I will review you gladly. Um, and he was grateful for the opportunity for that. I would never just walk away or I would never write something bad. I said, now, if I don't hear from you, I will never write about you. You know, I'm not out to hurt you. I'm just here to tell you that you're missing an opportunity that if I write about you, I will put in that it was inaccessible. And then I asked you to change that and you did for me. There so there are, there are all kinds of ways of going about it. And, and I realize that it takes personal courage. You really have to stand up for yourself, which means that you're standing up for the entire disability community who can't get go. into your restaurant. There you go, the, the power of the media too, and, and you knowing well, how to use that media. To, yeah, you have to find out where their pain point is, just like she wrote to the letters to the editor. Right. People do not want negative press. They can't right. afford it in this time. Yep. And um, if the way you word it, and you know, I want so much to go, I said to him, I want to be here. I want to, and he said, you want me to bring a food to you here? And I went, no, that's not the experience that I came for. I didn't yep. come to eat your eggs on the sidewalk. Yep. I need to go inside. Yeah. 
exactly. I have a, a member in, in my club that up in Winnipeg whose brother was institutionalized. He has he has um, he has not cerebral palsy. He has Down syndrome. They institutionalized him. And she yeah. tried for years to get him out, tries every single way. And she went to the media and they did a story about it. And he was released within the next month out of that. So the yeah, media the media, good power. the media can be powerful. They took away my handicapped signs. I have my own spot outside. And one day I came out and it was gone. And I went right to the alderman's office and I said, where's my sign? And they said, oh, we got a complaint that you didn't use your spot enough. And I said, I don't even know what that means. And so I'm not even going to go there. But obviously, it was just removed this morning because I could see it was wet out there. Um, and I said, so find the truck that just took it and bring it back. And they said, no, it had to go through City Hall once again oh to get God. it approved. Oh so it was going to be another uh, X amount of months. Well, after three months, I was annoyed. And so I asked the local news to come and do a live remote from my spot uh, on the 10 o'clock news. <laughs> and I looked into the camera and I said, Mayor Daly, what are you doing to me? And of course the sign was up the next morning. <laughs> there you go, there you go. The media is very powerful if you get the right people. Constance, yeah. your hand up again? Yes, okay. it is. Okay, um, thank you, thank you, Kim. Um, one of the things that I did also want to point out, not, not pursuant to this particular situation, but the broader advocacy question, it's important because in our individual situations, and not only in my heart, but also in my head, I'm very intimately aware of what my limitations are and what assistance I need in order to be able to do what I choose to do with my life. It's important for me to have the external view of the rest of the world. I will tell you from firsthand experience, people don't necessarily in general want to go out to make my life harder. They just don't understand the nuances of the things that make my life harder. Mm -hmm. I, uh, for many, many years as, a, as an educator with the sixth largest district in the, in the nation, that's the Clark County in Las Vegas. One of the jobs I had was to deliver teacher training programs on cultural diversity. And because I am who I am, the concept of disability was integral to that. Mm -hmm. We spent an entire Saturday morning where I would set up for these teachers who required to take this course for recertification, experiences, firsthand experiences. What did it mean to have visual impairment? What did it mean to have autism? What did it mean to have to navigate with crutches or with a walker or with a wheelchair? What did it mean to have an in, a hearing impairment? All, uh, not all, but many of the very firsthand experiences, these adults, these caring educators had never had That's firsthand funny. experience with. And every single time, that particular session was the most overwhelmingly enthusiastically received. And the universal comment was, I had no idea. Now I do. Yep. And that single change created such ripple effects in all the schools they went back to. We've got over 350 of them. So trust me, the impact was out there when every one of these people went back to their own schools and started looking at their facilities, looking at what they offered to the children, to their parents, et cetera, et cetera. So it's critical when we deal with advocacy. Yes, it's important for us on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but we can't ever deny the fact we've got access to a lot of ways we can impact folks on not only a one-on-one -on -one scale, but also on a large scale. I could never have gotten to the hundreds of schools myself to do that class, but I had hundreds of voices for me who now, because they struggled to open the bathroom and they did very simple things, walk in there with crutches, leave the meeting room, go to the bathroom, find your way into the stall as if you were going to have to take care of your business and then come back. That was the chore. Oh my goodness. And they always went in partners so the pairs could help each other. But they learned so much from the firsthand experience that they never would have because they had never done it. The other thing is when someone either breaks a leg or has some sort of a radical med medical issue that they that puts them in a wheelchair or puts them in a situation similar to what we experience on a daily basis, they turn around and look at us and they go, oh my God, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. So part of our advocacy is help increase the awareness and by experience, increase their sensitivity to not only what we deal with, but also what we need to do in order to overcome some of the things they simply take for granted. 
Absolutely. Bravo. I, and I think we need to think about the fact that sometimes it, places are not accessible, not because they're intentionally not accessible, but they didn't think about it. They didn't think about it. They and really didn't think, think about accessibility at all. And, and that's, that's the we're... tragedy of it is they they're building these marvelous buildings and they don't do it. I, I, the first year that the Lux are opened up here in Las Vegas, because it's in the shape of a pyramid and it has all these Egyptian motif things going on. I was curious to see what it was like. So I stumble in there. Now, at that point, I was not dealing with a walker or brace or wheelchair. I was pretty ambulatory. But I found every single floor that was a public use floor required steps going up and down to get to access that floor. Ah, there you go. You would get out of an elevator, you still had to either go up six steps or down six steps to get to whatever was on that floor. Other than the hotel rooms, I mean the public access places where the gambling was going on, where the meals were served, where the um, events were planned. And I went back to the management and I said, I hope you understand that part of what you need to think about is what can you do to make this place more accessible to people who can't handle and navigate steps easily? And they were like, but we thought we did it when we had the elevators. And I said, right, so now come with me. And we actually did a couple of examples where I said, where do you want me to go? Let's go there together. And because I would make them have to hold my hand as I struggled, struggled up and down the stairs, all of a sudden it was like, poof. Yeah, and once again, um, I, I, we, I have a, a member in my club again who um, lost his legs in a car accident, and he was a hotel manager. He never thought about people with disabilities and whether the, his hotel was accessible or not. But the day came that he lost his legs, and then he went back to be a hotel manager. Now he was thinking about it all the time. So once again, I, I think the average people, person doesn't think about if you don't have a disability, you don't think about it. You don't think about is but I mean in I'm in that field. So everywhere I go, I think about it. So, so is this accessible to people? And I think we need to do that and look at that. We have a right to we have a on the most it's not an obligation, but I think to humanity as being advocates, we should be doing that. Uh, John? Yeah. I you Right the way through the whole conversation, you've been bringing up a few things as as advocates, which are absolutely brilliant. Um, the courage that you're doing it for more. You don't re you don't realize that what you do actually impacts other people in a positive way as well. And the other thing that you've got to remember, uh, which comes up quite often, uh, is that you are not actually be you your disability is not actually stopping you. It is the built environment which is making you and the, it, it is the disabling factor. There you go. There you go. You've got, you know, you look at the, you look at the environment, you look at the pyramid, you look at the, you look at the various other places and it is the built environment that is the disabling factor. Um, I'll give you two very quick things before and then um, uh, I don't think we're going to get through everything today, Ken. But, <laughs> I have I like ten got... scenarios, and we're here on one, so that's yeah, fine. I know. And I think I think we I think we've actually hit on. I think we hit on a format which actually can help. Um, yeah. A, uh, I hate to uh, disagree with Carl on one thing. Not all countries have acts and legislation which actually makes um, everybody equal. For example, India doesn't, and Vietnam doesn't, Cambodia doesn't, uh, you know, Laos and various other things, M Myanmar certainly. So you've got even you've got those. But one of the one of the ways you can actually cause an absolute furore is, um, as you said, the media. Quick example: before they brought in a disability act inside the UK, uh, when I went to vote. And I was still able to get around on crutches and full length braces, calipers. Uh, I found that they'd actually gone and put it into the school, which I knew, um, the voting the voting place. Uh, but they'd actually moved it up steps and it was wet. And on crutches, steps and tiles are extremely dangerous, as everybody knows. So I sort of had a go and I then I then got hold of things. And I had people coming around and of course they were knocking on my door saying, why aren't you coming to vote? 
and the one of the candidates from it doesn't matter which party politics and i said this is why this is why this is why this is why i said the perfect example is that you shut the voting place down except for those with disabilities and the example is that you get the police to bring uh, to escort because every polling station in the uk has a police officer in it and you bring the polling boot boxes down and they can poll and put their vote in no 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 can't do that so eventually we landed up uh, rather like as you said with the media and it hit the media the next thing was that we had i had every single party who had a candidate on my doorstep uh, can we drive you can we do this can we do that and then i had the return what they call the returning officer the one who has to certify the things a bit like mike pence with that but had to do uh, the uh, last election and he turned around and he turned and they said right we're shutting it down and we're putting a broadcast out and we've got a list of all the registered disabled voters and we will go around and gather them all up and bring them in so we did so he did that the, the other one the other one for you very rapidly is uh buildings which are old are not necessarily found uh can't be adapted uh, I did one recently with a, I did one recently for a lady and we actually explored all the listing of the building and discovered that one part of it was not actually listed. So we were able to fit a lift shaft into it. So we go, we go through from there. But what you're doing, what you're doing by your simple actions is actually enabling people. You're enabling people. We may be of the older generation because we had PPS, but we've got others coming behind us with yeah. other things. Motor, yeah. motor neuron, Albergaire, Thyres, uh, MS, all the others, and God knows what's going to happen with long COVID. Uh, so we've got all these who are coming along behind us. It's yeah. our responsibility if we've got those to actually go out and do things we've got yeah. the experience we've got the knowledge we can do it so advocate not just for yourself but for others very good very good and you got to keep in mind too that once again it's it's your voice but you're actually speaking for thousands and thousands mm -hmm. of people when you do that there are thousands of people who has the same need that you have just a comment, John, on, on India. Uh, India does have rule uh, laws um, for accessibility. However, they're not being enforced. They're not yep, being enforced. Sorry. I have a member in my club who um, the buses were not accessible. Um, and so he uh, went to the, the bus company or the government or whoever was running it and said, there was a law that says these buses have to be accessible and they're not they change the buses they change the buses so there you go a voice Florence? Const constance can i just interrupt one minute constance yeah. i see and i see your note uh once again we are in a situation of uh two great speaking english language countries uh but they're divided by a common by the common language understood I got you, John. It was just a gentle nudge because those words um, rankle so often when one looks at the word enable as to be indulgent and to take over and to pamper to the victim, whereas empower is more of a uplifting kind of word, at least here across the pond. So hats off to you, sir. <laughs> uh, Florence? Yes, I wanted to piggyback on what Constance had said. I worked in the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine uh, when I was working. And what we did is during the summer, we usually had rotation of, um, of, of students that were studying medicine. And we took them and gave them disabilities. Made one a right hemi and made her walk with a cane and only one eye. We put somebody in a wheelchair and he couldn't get into the bathroom in the restaurant and he couldn't get up. And a few of those students became rehab specialists because of that experience. That's number one. Number two, I want to share what happened 
uh, when the ADA came in, I was able to get the mirrors on the wall in the bathroom changed so I could see the mirror. Because previous to that, it was flat and I really couldn't see it. One of the physical therapists came over to me and gave me a hit on the shoulder. And she said, it's your fault that I can't see the mirror. My God. How would you believe that? And I said to her, now you know what it's like. Yep, there you go. That was a physical therapist. Right. Wow. Wow. So I guess when just because they're in the field doesn't mean that they want to help or that they care. And right. as, as we said, we have to be our own advocate. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. Carol? Okay. Carol. Hey. The queen of advocacy is here. <laughs> <laughs> I've been fascinated by this this entire hour. Um, we're very engaged with a local health and county immunization coalition, and they had their annual dinner at a restaurant. And I got there, and the lift wasn't working. And uh, I was sitting there trying to figure out what to do. I stayed positive. I stayed upbeat. And the, a real good friend of mine, one of the heads of the coalition, she said, what's up? And I said, the lift is broken. She went and got the manager. And the manager said, we've got three firemen coming over who are going to carry you up the stairs. And my response to her was, you are very thoughtful. I appreciate it. But I think it's hard for you to understand. I'm not comfortable with that. I didn't say it's humiliating. I said, I'm not comfortable with that. And I didn't, and I, and I left. And I didn't have to do one other thing. The head of our county health immunization coalition and her assistant took care of it all. There's never been another event there. A letter was written about why they're walking with their feet. And they've been advocating with us ever since. And I, and I look back on it, your conversations allowed me to reflect on that. I don't think today I would handle it differently. I, I was gracious, I was kind, I was thoughtful, didn't get mad, but I held to three firemen, they're probably adorable by the way, <laughs> are gonna come over and carry me up and down the stairs. But the, the young woman had no clue how humiliating that would have been. Right. And, and therefore, um, just another another perspective on all this. Great conversation, you guys. And, and that's a good point that I was thinking about, too, because it was mentioned earlier that you could have, uh, Sharon could have been carried up the stairs. That's, no. that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a choice of somebody, but it is humiliating. And humil dangerous. And, and dangerous. And, and, and we have a district, in Rota, we have district governors, and the district governor went to went to uh, visit one of the rotaries and the rotary was down and she was in a wheelchair and the rotary was down down the stairs and they said we'll carry you down she said no you're not going to carry me down you're going to change the location of your of your of your rotary and you, yeah man, huh? that's something to think about yes dignity and and um exactly um, right that's not necessarily an option that's not an option right well this has been really quite extraordinary and the participation has been so welcome and thoughtful. Um, and, and, and of course, John and Ken, you were right. You know, we, we are the voices of advocacy and how we do it um, individually can help other people learn how to do it for themselves and therefore the broader community as well. Um, is there anything, Anne, it was your first time here. We're happy to have you here. Thank you so much. I'll read that. Thank, thank you. I, I couldn't figure out how to do the hand or I would have That's said. That's okay. That, That's okay. Anyway, I'm here uh, yeah. really because yeah. my partner has polio and has had for 30 right. plus years. Long before I knew her, she was she had yeah. been to a polio support group and people said, well, why don't you get us coffee? But that's a long time ago. I just <laughs> want to say thank you for everything you're doing. And also to mention, I was a quote unquote polio vi pioneer. Um, oh, getting, were you? Yeah, I was seven years old in, in yeah. Indiana and I still remember it. So I have my post polio pioneer button and she has her post polio, her polio, post polio. Um, yeah. So thank you. It's a, a friend of mine just sent me the link and um, 
I, I think I can encourage her to be here the next time if I know sure. when. So thank you. Sure. So the fourth Thursday of each month, we have a, a meeting, sometimes a speaker, but now we, we realize this, there's more to be discussed in the open meetings because we want to hear from people and their life experiences. And while we're not a support group, there are plenty of places for that story to be told and honored. Um, we really um, want to figure out how do we make things better for us and for the people around us who need it. And I don't, she didn't understand. I think she was like advocacy. It's over there. And I think hearing yeah. being it's, with a large group from so many places. Yeah. She, in your own experiences. She, she will probably, I hope yeah. your next time. Yeah, well, and, and give Thank give you. her a personal invite. Yes, John. Yeah. Uh, and to to Anne, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I know that you got the link passed on to you, but do you know how to use the chat on the side of the um, screens or not? I do, but I find it really um, it really interferes with my paying attention. But well, yes, you, I know how to do that. Okay. Could you could you put your email address in so we can keep sure. in touch with you? Absolutely. Uh, that, way, that, that way you will get the yes. newsletter and you will get the links. Yes, I would and please that. share and please share everybody. Please share it as well. Uh, so, email address. I, there's no better advocates than people that are experiencing the situation. I mean, the people with disabilities make the best advocates because they know it better than the person who doesn't have a disability. Um, and then and, and Florence, the situation where she was working to change the mirror angle. People would never think about that that don't have disability. Never, ever think about it. But Florence knew it because of the of the of the challenges she's facing. So uh, we in this room make the best advocates. We really do. I was at a hotel room in California a few weeks ago, and it was an accessible room. It did have a, a roll-in shower, and that was nice. And that was the only thing that was accessible about the entire place. Yeah, there was a grab bar by the toilet, but um, I could not see the mirror in the in the bathroom because. I would have to stand and there was no way I could stand to put my makeup on. There was no table where I could sort of roll up to it and put my makeup out and do it there. And I wrote a very long, oh, and they charged me a resort fee, even though they had a tiny swimming pool on the second floor that was not accessible. And I wrote to them and said, that's unacceptable. You have to take off the resort, the, you know, the resort fee of $35 a day and remember when you have anybody booking the accessible room that the chances of them using your quote resort facility in here downtown West Hollywood, it's not okay. And here are the things that were wrong with the room, including a hook to put my clothes on that was much too high that I couldn't reach. And I did get a really lovely letter back saying we had no idea, we thought we had done the right thing. And your suggestions are gonna make a difference in how we now reconfigure that room. And so it's it's yeah. it's a constant job. It, it's our job, you know. And I take it seriously. Exactly. So, that's and it. you know what? Uh, this hotel manager told me that people without disabilities ask for the hand, the disability room, the disability room, because it's bigger and spacious, and oh. they they want. It. And that's wrong. They should not be allowing people who do not have a disability to 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 rent out that room. It shouldn't happen. Carla has a hand up. I know. Just a quick comment. I think that um, I'm on several polio Zoom groups. There are people in our groups who have never spoken up for themselves right. to even a family member. One person said, I have never talked to my wife about the P word. And I'm going, um, his son did not know that that's what was going on with his legs and one arm. And I think all of us need to be really comfortable talking to family, talking to relatives, and then spread out to friends. If you can't do it right at home, that advocacy is not going to be very meaningful when you go out in public. That's true. I, I think I mentioned this a long time ago. I was on a, a, a very big film festival circuit when my documentary came out. And there were, at every stop, there were at least three to five people who would lean over the table afterward when I was doing a book signing. And they would say to me, 
you know, I had polio, but we never told anybody. My parents told me to keep it a secret and we've never talked about it. And then I would say, so are you having any late effects of polio? And they go, no, no, it's just aging. It's just aging. And I went, okay. And then I usually ask, do you have a sibling uh, close in age? And they'll say yes. And I said, well, are they having some, you know, kind of things going on with their body that the doctor can't understand? And, and many of them would say, yeah, they don't, they're not, they're not really talking about it. And I said, well, it's a good chance that your sibling had a light case of polio and is yeah. now having post-polio syndrome as well. I mean, the amount of secrecy, the amount of non-disclosure is what we see now and people don't understand why they're struggling. And you, know, you, have, to, you, have, you, have, to, ahead. you have to, you have to remember that um, for every one case of paralytic polio, yes, there are anything between 200 and 1000 asymptomatic cases. Now I, I this, I'm going to go name dropping. Um, you've got, you've got, you've got, you've got people like uh, I, I was. I was talking at a Rotary function, at a um, which come in Ireland and Britain, and uh, I had Rotarians coming up to me and talking to me and saying, um, "But I've never told anybody I had polio. Mm -hmm. I've never had this. I've never had that." Uh, and I, I got swamped, uh, and as did Carol Pandek, who some of you know. Um, the, uh, uh, and the, the unfortunate thing was that they were still talking to me and I had a, the, the delegation was around about 400 at the, at the meeting. And, uh, I still had about a hundred talking to me when somebody you might've heard of called Bono from a group <laughs> called U2 was actually standing up on stage and trying to, trying to get them going. But, you know, it's got to be, it's got to be done and you can do it. And you are doing it and you're going ahead and doing um, the, the uh, and a lot, a lot of places, you know, there's still in some places, polio is still stigmatized. Yes. Um, and the, the I'll, I'll give you a, a prime example, what we can take away is stigmatism. Um, in Ireland at one stage, when I, I, I did some work with the Parkinson's disease of Europe and Parkinson's Ireland, as well as the UK, and actually helping them formulate policies and we, we went we went through and we looked at the whole thing and all of a sudden that we started getting requests coming back from the irish contingent uh their members uh saying will you please change your franking on your envelopes where you send out your information because it says you know parkinson's disease island and people are now getting hold of this understanding it and, but they don't know what Parkinson's is, and they think I'm going to catch it. I talk to these people, you know, and it 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 is it is that it is that sort of area that you get to. The other one is you know you who, whoever realised that um, inside the royal family in the UK at one stage was a polio survivor. I know Lord I know Snowden. that's who I'm talking about. Princess, yeah, Lord Snowden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Princess Margaret's husband was a polio. Mm -hmm uh but and and but if you went in it, and that's what caused things to happen inside of certain of the buildings inside yeah. the royal estate so right. they went through from there can i make and, a suggestion that everybody contact a local rotary group and offer to talk during national polio month or the polio week which is uh october 24th is national is their rotary polio day worldwide but sometime in the month of october and you don't have to be a, a great speaker. You just tell the story of when you got polio, tell the story of post polio with the late effects on you, um, explain that you understand that eradication is number one on their list and just remind them that we're still here. It, it's so simple. It's just like talking to us and you're talking to people who need to hear it because they also have donor fatigue about they keep raising money and they're exhausted but anytime they see a polio and they have never met one that they know of um, who's willing to speak out about it, it really is highly impactful. So that can we can take that away today as an assignment. Just call a local rotary and say, I'm available to you during the month of October. I know, um, Dick has his hand up. Yep. 
Yeah, I just wanted to thank all 27 of you for coming today and for being advocates. I know you uh, went to trouble to get here, and we thank you for being here, and we thank you for advocating in your own ways as you can. Yeah, bravo. Thank you, Dick, for saying that and reminding us. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, yeah. I can't all figure right. out how to raise my hand electronically. I'm sorry. Okay, Alex. Go on. <laughs> But I'd like to add, uh, I'm the assistant district governor for uh, Rotary District 7630 in Area 30 here in Delaware. And uh, I can tell you that um, uh, program plans in our area are far beyond October at this point. Uh, and uh, it's fine to uh, contact Rotary clubs near you or in your uh, home area to offer yourself, but be aware that you may not have the opportunity to make that presentation during uh, polio uh, month. Understood. Uh, Understood. Invite Alex, me any, anytime, any week Alex. will do. Anytime will do. Anytime. Anytime will do, absolutely. Alex, it's, it's, invite me to a district meeting. I'll be happy. <laughs> Thank you, Ina. And, uh, George, good, George has his hand up. Sorry, yeah. John. George, go yeah. ahead. George? Yeah, no, no. Yeah, um, following on what Ina said, um, it, I find it quite difficult to um, get the point across because I walk into a room uh, and there is no sign of my polio. Um, and I've got to, you know, there's, there's almost a resistance to listening to me because I, I, I'm I'm obviously perfect, you know. <laughs> what's what's <laughs> what's wrong with you? Um, and, and and then to get you know to get past that um, and see a little about what's happened to me, which isn't a lot compared with what's happened to loads and loads of of, of my associates, uh, and so. Um, do we have to take somebody in a wheelchair or in crutches to make the, you know, to get the message across? It no, I think you to have to, I, George, I think you just have to repeat what, um, what John talked about in terms of um, how so many people had it, but didn't have any obvious paralysis from it. And you were one of those quote oh. lucky ones, but that doesn't mean that you don't oh. understand. Yeah. No, I still had the paralysis and 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 oh. and, and problems, uh, you know. But but the but I don't present what um, the public uh, perceive as a disabled person. I'll go rent uh, a wheelchair. And I think that's a barrier to get across. <laughs> go rent a wheelchair, George. Just rent one for the day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Lawrence. Yeah. Lawrence has her hand up. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, and I get just the opposite reaction. I go into a room and I'm treated like an idiot. Like oh, I did nothing. Yeah, yeah, I, we know. Yeah. This, this is routine, routine. I get so annoyed, I have to tell them my education, my qualifications, et cetera. It's very annoying. So I guess- yeah, that, that, And that's the naive people yeah. who don't have it's disabilities. Old, yeah. and, 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 and the other thing people don't like is being told, oh, you're an inspiration. Um, oh. I'm, I'm, I'm going out to get a cup of coffee. Well, you're an inspiration because you're, you know, what you're doing. Do, to get do I, I'm going to tell you how I end just in case anybody invites me to speak like Alex. So the last thing I say is, I know that you all think I'm an inspiration. I said, but we in the disability community, we run the risk of it becoming disability porn. Now, of course, if that makes me a disability porn star, then I'll take it. <laughs> But I mean, that's an that's a insult to so many people, actually, to say. You're I know, I know, I know. And we don't do that in the disability community. We don't. I know. We, that's what they always say to me. I'm, a dis, yeah. I'm an inspiration. Yeah. I'll tell you, we have a club here. And I have one young lady who lost both hands and both feet. She walks with prosthesis. And uh, she is an inspiration. The woman goes rock climbing, water rafting. It, she's an amazing, an amazing human being. Well, so, I think she's just living her life. I don't think she's an inspiration. She's just living.
Yeah, but I mean, when people say to you, walking down, you go into the street and you, they're, oh, what an inspiration that you're out here in public and you're doing this. Really? Yeah, I know. Believe me. That, I that is not an inspiration. That's Yeah, I get life. it. That's I life. get that. I get that. Ben, yeah. All right. Is, can, one more thing, one, John. There is, there, is one, there is one thing, and I've had the perfect example here today, somebody who used to work with me and she came in with her three-year-old. Now, I've known the three-year-old ever since she was um, before she was born. Um, the, but the, the situation is that it goes right the way through. If you want to become an advocate, one of the things that you can do is talk when they when they when they somebody turns around and says, "Mummy, what's that? Why is that person walking funny or anything else like that?" Quite often, you will find that it opens up. A discussion or it opens up an opportunity and the children accept things as they are they accept people and they go through and grace doesn't pay a blind bit of notice to my wheelchair the only thing she wants to do is jump on it and have a ride uh the but the you know and you go through and you work through with others and you can advocate for others as well in different ways we have a large show agricultural show in this part, it's the largest agricultural show actually one day in, in Europe. And I was over there one day and I had my out, uh, one of my big power chairs with me and I was going around and there happened to be a postman there. And my wife used to work for the post office in Ireland and their, their youngster, Down syndrome. And uh, he, he comes up, he starts looking at the wheelchair. So I start talking to him. And he talks back and he's going on and everything else like that. And the mother's looking at me a bit worried, doesn't know who the hell I am. And her husband said, well, this is the husband of the, our occupational health advisor. And I, look, I looked at him, I said, George, do you want to ride? He said, and he went, can I? And I said, yeah. So I picked him up, put him on my knee and we took off for about half an hour. Came back and his mother was in absolute floods of tears. Somebody had accepted her child as a normal person mm. now that's advocating that going around and showing him what was going on and allowing him to do things was advocating for down syndrome children but for all children who had a disability or have problems with autism or whatever it may be there you go yeah i know um dominica has her hand up yeah Dominic, okay. yes i i wanted to make the point that children are naturally curious they're interested in just about everything but the sad thing is sometimes children will ask questions and before the person can respond or do anything like what John just told us about the parents say oh no no don't look don't look. come here and child away and all that kind of thing but I, ha I have a, a story about my grandfather who was very crippled with arthritis as he became older and he walked with crutches and he was in a shop one day with his crutches and a little child ran up to him and said do those things come off? So he was able to explain his crutches. That's so, nice. But, yeah, that was lovely. But some parents pull their children away. Oh, they yeah. Don't want, yeah, which is sad. Because they're telling the children that disability is something horrible. In many places in the world, that happens. Even some countries are even worse. They, they consider it a, a curse. You're cursed. Well, I remember hearing when I was little, to sitting with the adults, that having a disability was a fate worse than death. That's what, yeah. that's what I heard them say. There you go. There you go. And I said, uh, it doesn't mean, that can't be me. <laughs> and, 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 and John had mentioned the fact that Parkinson people are, don't want to be around you because they can't, can't, they don't want to catch Parkinson's. I don't know right. if the same thing, I don't know if the same thing happens with polio, the people like, can I catch polio from you, you know? Right. And we still get that these days. Yeah, we yeah. still, really? in certain parts of the world, get it that where you've you've had you 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 are now an acute case of polio uh, many years ago, and you've actually gone you've gone through uh, that people turn around and say, oh, "I could catch." And I've had, believe it or not, we've had a physiotherapist not so long ago turn around and refuse to deal with somebody because they were scared of catching polio from them. Uh, and the the other thing, uh, the other thing, quickly before uh, uh, Carla comes back in, is that um, 
Florence said about going in and having to explain her uh, her qualifications and everything else. I can see she's using a power chair because I can see her headrest. Um, one of the things which probably, you know, we have to educate people as well is that uh, wheelchairs are not actually there for leaning on, leaning over, pushing yeah. around, acting as a yeah. public leaning post. Right. And we have to advocate on that as well, right. not right. just for ourselves, but for you, you may you may have a, a disabled child and, they, and people just lean on their wheelchair, push it around. It's very uncomfortable. Then you may have an elderly relative. There's nothing wrong with them. They've got all their marbles. It's just that they've got uh, osteoporosis or something like that. So you, once again, you're advocating for others again. Carla. You're on mute, good? Carla. On hot days like yesterday and today, I am in shorts. I'm sorry. I don't care whether people see my braces or not. And when I am downtown walking around and people stare at my braces, I go, nice legs, huh? And <laughs> <laughs> uh, we always have to take the high road, don't we, Carla? Well, yeah. And you know, it starts a lot of conversations. And um, I love it when little kids look at my legs. My, I call my braces my legs. Anyway, but, you know, their parents are, don't stare. And I'm going, I'm bionic. Do you want to touch them? And the parent is, of course, ah! and I love it. I just go ahead and the kid and I have a grand old time. And one of my favorite things now that I have a grand in my life, she cannot leave my house from having a visit here without being taken for a ride in my chair. Um, and it's she's going to grow up to know that I'm just as normal as anybody else with some differences. And I love it. She's but so happy and she's trying to run the chair at almost three years old and we're working Bravo. on backwards, Bravo. forward, to the side. But, you know, nice legs. Never hurt anybody. Thank you, Are Carla. We... That's a perfect story to end today. Perfect story. Nice legs, Carla. <laughs> I know. I, yeah. I know. The, the one thing that actually comes through here when you're talking about advocating and looking at it, look at the veterans. Look at the vets. Look at the ones who are coming back. Look at the ones who are going to the disability games, the Paralympics, or oh, just yeah. appearing. These days, you've got a lot of them who've got uh, full prosthetics and everything else. They're not trying to hide them. They're going around wearing shorts. They're showing what they've got. They're showing what they they are, and they are actually normalising the the conditions yes. of, of of people. And that is what advocates do. They normalize the situation for the people in the community and make your life and everybody else's life rather more meaningful, rather more, I won't say easier, but rather more- Normalized. Normalized, yes. And that, that, that's what it is. That's what advocates do. They normalize things for themselves and for others. Fair enough. Can we end on that one today? Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody.